Okay, why don't we go ahead and get started. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all. I'm Ernie Martin from the Maine Department of Transportation. I'm the project manager. Um, it doesn't seem like it was that long ago, but I was here three years ago in March. Um, and here we are in 2014 May, so uh, it's been a long time. Um, hopefully everybody got an agenda. Everybody have one of those. Just kind of lays out what we're going to process we're going to go down through. Hopefully everybody has a chance to sign in. Um, there's business cards over there as well, as well as comment cards. Um, take a comment card if you have questions later on. There's also self-stamped, uh, self-addressed stamped envelopes to, to mail that in to me if you think of something later on. Um, as far as introductions go, I'm Bob Carroll, my assistant man, uh, project manager is back there. Luke Beyond from our property office. He's going to do a right-away presentation for you <laughs> later on. Natasha Collins is a highway designer. She's going to talk a little bit about the, the nice color stuff up there. And Brian Nichols from our bridge program, he's going to talk about the, the box culvert. And he'll get into what that is under the roadway. Um, as you remember, last time we were here, we weren't replacing the pipe and we weren't putting a signal in. Well, the good news is we're doing both of those now. So um, that will take care of a lot of, the, a lot of the concerns that we heard last time. Um, so Natasha will get up and do her presentation, followed by Brian, then Luke will get up and just go over the right-of-way process, you know, when, when we hand the project off to him to start that right-of-way process and, and take off with it. Then after Luke is done, I'll talk a little bit about the timeline, you know, moving forward from tonight. So with that, I'll turn it over to Natasha and she'll go down to the, the highway portion.
and 27 inches of gravel and 3 inches of pavement on the shoulder. Um, the light blue, like I said, will be an open build, so it'll all have a nice new rising surface. Um, box clover down here, like I said, I'll let Brian explain all of that. But for the most part, this is a very, very basic design. We're putting in a signal, replacing the box, adding in a lane to get vehicles over, turning right, so anyone that's going straight through the intersection, you won't have to worry about trying to pass someone on, on the left, crossing the line. And for any vehicles that's coming out of Hill Road, if you'll not have a clear line of sight looking down 111 to Biddeford, and you'll have a signal here if you're, if you're taking that left, so you don't have to worry about trying to run out into traffic. Um, it's basically my presentation. I don't have a lot for you guys tonight. Um, if you have any particular questions about your house, about what any of these fill lines mean and what they look like, I've got cross sections with me as well to show you. Um, please, please don't hesitate to ask any questions. There's no such thing as a, as a dumb question. So, thank you very much. Yeah, so we can just we can just hold the questions okay. until we get through the presentations, and we'll we'll do that right after. Thank you. I don't know if Brian will go down to the box color design. Thank you, Ray. Uh, this first thing I'll do, we'll talk about what's out there now. Right now, you might know it's a five foot diameter call. Uh, usually, when I come to these things, I'm saying how bad condition the call is in, so I say why we need to replace it. That's not the case here. This call is still in relatively good condition. Uh, but the, the intersection work is necessitating a, a longer barrel through the under the road. Probably the first thing you might be asking me is why don't you just extend that? Well, that's a good question. That's an alternative I did investigate. A uh, couple, couple factors here. One, the existing pipe is undersized as it is. Uh, heavy rain event, you are getting water backing up. A uh, foot and a half, two feet in a big event. Um, also, another factor is the downstream end is hanging, meaning it's not submerged in the, in the flow, it's, it's hanging, so the water's coming out, kind of cascading down. Environmental regulations being what they are, uh, we need to be concerned about fish passage, making sure the small fish can uh, navigate upstream. <clears throat> so the three valuable alternatives that we investigated, uh, one was a, a, a larger steel pipe, pipe arch uh, that had a, uh, that was size to handle the hydraulic flow. Uh, you'd be buried two feet down in a uh, little stream bed. That's another thing environmental regulations like to see is any buried structure. You bury them a couple feet below stream bed so that there's a natural bottom to it. Uh, fish and other aquatic life. Uh, you want more at home. That had a, like a 50 year lifespan. The other two investigations we need, uh, alternative we investigated was a precast box culvert. One was a four sided box that we put in, also submerged to the below stream bed. And the other one was a three sided box built on concrete footings. Uh, both have their advantages, both have their disadvantages. One uh, three sided box, it's the time to pour the, foot, pour the footings because that has to be cast in place on the site. Uh, whereas a four sided box is precast, gets put to the site, and installed. Disadvantage of the four side box is uh, we have shallow bedrock there. That bedrock's going to have to be excavated to get the things set down the road. So, we eventually did looking at cost, looking at uh, construction sequencing and time, did settle on the four side box cover. It is a 12 foot span by 8 foot rise. Again, that's submerged, it's uh, set two feet below grade. It ends up being a six foot uh, rise, so 72 square foot opening. But, like that's a lot bigger than the five foot diameter pipe. And the reason being, again, environmental regulations being what they are, uh, like to match the width of the box more with the width of the actual screen head. Aquatic life, uh, fish, aquatic mammals as well, makes it easier to uh, navigate up and down the stream. Also slows down the velocity of the, of the water. Uh, if you're thinking fish probably have the same limitations we do. They can't, they can't jump high elevation drops and they can't swim in fast current. So slow current down that helps satisfy a lot of the environmental regulations that we face. Uh, so if you look at the, look at here, again this is the section, 
So if we cut it right down the center the yellow line, you're looking up through the box, you'll see the, the gray area is the box. Um, the section, transverse section shows up a little better if you see the, the green. It's kind of hard to see from probably back where you are. That's the two feet of what we call the invert fill, the, the natural stream material that we put back in. And then these little gray boxes are uh, concrete uh, retention sills that are put in the box culvert to help kind of keep that fill uh, retained. So in a heavy flow, heavy rain event, all that stuff doesn't just get pushed out downstream. So, anybody has any questions at the end? Yes. This project is going to require primarily three types of rights to be acquired. Um, the right-of-way line on this plane is shown. You can't see it, obviously, back there, but when you come up, the solid red, da uh, the, so the heavy red dash lines that runs down the sides of both roads. We don't have enough right-of-way to build this turn lane, so we have an, a fee acquisition that we will need to acquire from the two property owners over here. The side of Hill Road, this road has been creeping, actually, the right of way is in the middle of the turn lane right now. It's the middle of the, right, uh, middle of the roadway. And over the years, that road's been moving over a little bit, straightening up. It has become, in our world, what we call rock portion. Everybody thinks it's road. We maintain it as road. We utilize it as road. So we're going to square up the right of way and have an actual setback there. You're supposed to have a, a clear zone so if someone slides off the road, they're not going to hit any deadly fixed objects or anything. So we're going to square up that right of way. So the three property owners on this side will be affected by an actual fee acquisition. Probably going to be a drainage easement. I know there's going to be one around here and possibly the water flowing through here. At the same time, we'll probably have some temporary rights for blending. Those rights will go away once the project is completed. On this side over here, we're probably going to need a drainage easement since uh, I'm not, at this point, not seeing that the one exists and probably some temporary rights to put in the coffer dam to build this. Uh, are the, any of these four property owners here tonight? Okay. Um, primarily, we're going to come back at this point. We're going to go back to the office after tonight, review all the comments that we get, button up the plans in the near future, and once the design team gets to the point of saying we're done, um, and, and with determining the furthest extent outside of the right-of-way that we need to go, then my team can take over the acquisition of these rights. doesn't mean the plans are at 100%. They can do all they want with figuring out the quantities and, and how much fill and how much the box is going to cost and everything else inside those rights, but to the fullest extent out is what I work with. You'll know that's going to happen when you're going to get a letter from me. Don't panic. These rights are fairly simple, minimal. It's the same letter Federal Highway has me send out if I have to take your house for a new road. <laughs> I'll warn you now. This is one of those government form letters. Um, shortly thereafter, an appraiser will contact you. By state and federal law, you have the right to meet with the appraiser when they do their inspection of your property. Please do that. We don't have x-ray vision. Any concerns about the project, any concerns about the impact on your property, anything that may be uh, buried out there that we haven't picked up, we'd like to know about. Once the appraisal has been submitted, completed, submitted, reviewed, um, there's a couple other things going on parallel with this. We have, obviously, we're dealing with water, so our environmental office is doing an uh, environmental survey, getting the other state agencies and federal agencies involved to sign off on the permits that we need to do this project. And also our legal department is updating the title so we know who to deal with and who to cut the check to for the rights that we're going to acquire. When all of that's together, then I can make an offer. Um, someone will come out, contact you. If you're leaving town for the winter or something, kind of let someone know or let us know on how to reach you so we can contact you when the time comes. Since I've disclosed to you that we're going to need to take rights in your property, this is directed at the four property owners only. Um, you're now required under state law, if you put your property up for sale or if it's currently for sale, to let the buyer know that the DOT intends to do this. 
I don't really need to explain this whole thing tonight. We just need to let them know, let the buyer know that we're thinking about doing, or we are going to be doing this, and that we will need to take rights, and <coughs> they might want to contact us so we can get them a, a plan so they understand what's going on. Um, if you have a survey with any property pins out here along the road in the area of work, we're going to want to make sure that those pins are identified. If they are disturbed during the process, you can request when the project is completed for us to put a replacement pin back at its current location. If you have a current survey deemed acceptable by our surveyors, they may consider putting the pin back at the edge of the new right away line for you, but it has to meet certain criteria. Every plan is unique. What else to worry about? I think that's about it right now. We'll be available to answer questions here in a moment. Thanks. Okay. As Luther mentioned, you know, we got the next step of finalizing all the outer limits with the design. All the cuts and fills that Natasha mentioned, you know, we need to finalize all those, get to that plan impact complete stage of the project. Um, from there, Luther takes over. Um, right now, I have a January of 15 advertised. Um, a couple things that we have to work through. Uh, right now, the environmental agencies are looking at a July 15th to September 30th work window, which is the time frame to work in the box. That's the critical piece of, of this project as far as construction goes. <coughs> Obviously, we've got to dig a trench across Route 111 um, with the high volumes that we have. So, we've got to look at that. Can we get an open work window? You know, for the project, does that mean can, what that means is can we work year round? You know, I impact the fish and stuff that we're trying to um, work around in the stream. So that's a couple things that we have to work around. So right now, I'm looking at January 15 advertise. Then the question comes in: Can we do nighttime construction out there? You know, to minimize traffic. Um, so that's something we're, we're going to analyze and obviously, you know, coordinate with the town. Obviously, you, you got some emergency. Um, folks here tonight as well that will have to be coordinating with them on what our anticipated construction timeline is and if it's going to be daytime or nighttime construction. So that's going to be a, a discussion we're going to do internally. So um, so still a lot to, to discuss outside the design. I think the design is, is looking pretty good. Um, so we just have to wrap up all those finite details about the construction aspects and how to communicate that. Um, with that, um, we're at the Q&A. Um, what we need to do, so uh, one of our friends is here this evening to, to record the meeting for us, is just raise your hand and you can stand up if you want. Just uh, state your name, let us know if you're a property owner, and, and just let us uh, know any questions you may have. I'd all, also like to thank Todd for setting the meeting up for us tonight and also leading the meeting. Uh, we also have Representative Perry here this evening. Uh, he's actually on the Transportation Committee. Um, you know, representing all tra all transportation for the state. So, um, welcome. Um, so with that, let's turn it over to question and answers. Do you have a question? <laughs> I have a comment. Um, it's a name. Oh, sorry. My name is Diane Robbins. I live in the town of Orlando, and I am a property owner. I own the whole field on the opposite side. That field, yes. Um, I had a question about, are these going to be like stoplights so they're going to stop all the traffic on 111? Yep, it'll be a full, it'll be a full signalized intersection. Okay. And the rest of it, I think you guys, you answered my question about what you were going to do on my side. So I'll have to see what your plans are. Yeah, we can, we can certainly, you know, show you what the cross sections look like after, after we're done, just to show the impacts are. What's your question? Um, do you know that Ethan Robbins, Matthew Lefebvre? <laughs> 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 Is the road going to be hitting me my unpaid land right here? A little bit. So it's going to be touching it? Possibly, right, right in this area right here. Where else works? Because I don't want any road touching my own land. I don't want to touch it. 
<laughs> you go fishing with him? You don't go fishing with him? So you can't prove, I can't ask you if there's actually fish in the stream? Actually, there are. Yeah, trust me, there are. It's uh, right now a little too dangerous. <laughs> yeah. As Brian alluded to, I, I mean, when this, when this is, is placed, it's going to be, you know, submerged a little bit, you know, so it's not going to be hanging like it is today. So that, that by itself is going to help the fish get up and down as well as the velocity of the, the flow of water to, to get through the pipe. Right, because right now that culvert is like pounding my, I mean, I used to have another whole fence box <laughs> that's like gone um, since they replaced the culvert. Because I've owned this now for over 20 years. So I've seen it, I, I've seen it at its best and I've seen it at its worst. Um, but right now, the way that culvert is designed, it's really chewing away at both mine and Rosemary's because it just pounds at it. You know, when we were using the wall seeds tonight, I didn't mention this when I was up there, the upstream and downstream ends can be riprapped and the, the rock uh, aprons, uh, and that will help reduce the erosion. We want it for up that down the as well. I apologize for mentioning that earlier. Sorry. Uh, the Andrew Boyce, I'm one of the residents, and I'm one of the selectmen. Um, speed limit. Is that going to change at all? No. So there's going to be no decel speed limit at all? Uh, we haven't really looked at that coming into the signalized intersection yet. That'll be something that we'll be looking at, but no no anticipation because of the signal. Obviously, that'll be a mechanism to, to slow folks down. Um, how about paying for power for that? Like, who pays for that? Um, I've talked to Todd about that, and obviously that's a, the key to getting the signalized intersection. The state's going to have to have an agreement with the town to, to maintain and cover the cost of the power. Which Todd, um, Todd can probably speak, he has another intersection that he pays for on, on the cost, Todd. Yeah, we have two others that we... Two others? Yes. Uh, just, go ahead, Roger. Just one. Just one? We don't pay for one of them? Campground, two in room one. There's two in room one, but the DOT maintains the one at Log Cabin and... Yeah, oh, because both of those are everything. The one at the market is ours. The maintenance, power, and, and how much? I mean, I'm sorry, but I need to know this because I have to vote on this. What are we? What are we paying yearly to keep that pop, to keep that light and to maintain it? Under a thousand dollars a year for the power, Diane, and we budget two thousand dollars a year for maintenance. Typically, we run up to a maximum of $1,500. If lights go out or something gets hit, worst case scenario, that's what the cost is. Okay, so well once the light's there, then the pole and the light and everything becomes the town's responsibility? The poles will be a responsibility of the utilities, but the, the maintenance of those, the, the signals themselves, and the power of feeding those signals is a responsibility and maintenance of the town. And I have to ask. Why? Can I get to my question, please? <laughs> Why? <laughs> I mean, this is, you know, the light is serving very few people from around the right? It's just, it's a travel lane. And I just, you know, why is the town responsible for paying for that? That comes from our traffic division at DOT. It doesn't come from... The highway program is just part of the, the rules and regulations and policies that are associated with the, with our traffic program. Um, so I don't know if that answered your why, but um, that's a motion. Uh, probably not. Um, it, it, and you're not alone. I mean, there's other signals all across the state that towns pay for. Um, we'll put them in, but that's part of the agreement. We put it in. You you pay for the electricity and you maintain for us. That's kind of like personal property, you know, right away, you mow the lawn, thank you for more. I want. Yeah. You know, you prune our trees, thank you for pruning our trees. But it's, it's the same thing, you know, it's, 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 it's a give and take. But I think the overall improvement in safety is worth the money on the down path. Well, my last question is um, the stoppage of traffic. I know you talked a little bit about maybe doing some construction at, at night. Um, a provision is going to be put in case, you know, there's a trench across the road and we have a, a real bad accident. And is there going to be something allowing to maybe put some steel plates or something that they let traffic through in case of a real bad emergency? Correct. Yeah, they, they got to, 
the, the contract is going to be responsible for providing access to and from properties, uh, obviously, and to the mainline. Okay, Diane. Yeah. It's Suzanne the door, and my eyes are seeing right. It looks like you're going to start the breakdown lane before the driveway, before the hill road. No, that, you said right there, that driveway. Yep, that's where the, the taper for that right hand turn is going to start. Push it back that way some more. Push it back this way some more? Yeah, no, that way. way. It's going to go right across the front of our driveway, the brake lane. Our driveway? Yeah, that driveway. That's our driveway right there. Oh, it is? Where is it? No. You said your driveway right there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mine's going up. Yeah, okay. Well, what we're going to do is blend your driveway in at that point to meet the new new paved shoulder that we're putting in where that taper starts. And we're just going to blend it back into a point and we're also going to put a new cross cover under your driveway. And another thing, uh, Okay, when we're going to have a light there. So if there's so much traffic at certain times of the day, how am I going to get out of my driveway still? They're going to block it. Yeah, they, I don't think... They we, will we, just block it. Is there any way that they can put up, when the light changes, if they can stop at a certain point, or white line or something? Or? Yeah, the, the... I can't get out of the driveway now half the time. Yeah, in the in the peak times, that's why we have kept that right hand dedicated right lane because there's a lot of right hand turning movements. Those are going to be free rights. So when this is red, they're still going to be able to go. The reds will stop at main line, and then obviously we'll flush out the road to get to get that. You're, you're, you're going to have you're going to have gaps. It's still not going to help. You'll have gaps in the in the signal to get out. I don't know. And, and another thing, for years back, I called the OJ. He put a uh, sign up there for the hill road in the wrong place. I called and called, and then I gave up. They finally called and said that they put a sign up on the hill road. So I was really excited. They put a little sign on the telephone pole, hill road. The other sign is still there saying that my driveway is a hill road. So my lawn, that's the turnaround lane on my lawn, and, and then I, and people are backing out on the Route 111 all the time. I'm, I'm surprised no one's oh, I've seen them. And you know, some of them will come up the driveway and turn around, but they go so fast. I've got grandchildren and great-grandchildren here. It scares me to death. We'll take care of that for you. <laughs> Promise? Promise. <laughs> take care of the grandchildren? <laughs> great. great. No, I'm going to take care of the grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> How about the great? <laughs> Sir? Uh, Kip Tam, landowner. Um, I've, I've been there for 46 years, so... I know. No, we were there when you moved in. Oh, that's right. <laughs> um, the, the drainage on that brook sucks. That brook is, is, has been washing out over, I mean, bad over the last 25, 30 years. And have, has there been any thought about that, that culvert on Hill Road instead of taking it downstream but moving the water upstream? Because what you're doing is you're driving it back over Hill Road. All that area floods right there and then it has to go back down under 111. And further on down, you diverted it back under 111, and you just you're sort of like zigzagging across, and I think you're making more of a problem than need be. And I don't know, I mean, it's great that there's going to be a bigger culvert, moving more water, but then what, with that, that water flow going down, when when the rains really come, how much more washing out is it is going to occur upstream? Yeah, I mean, it's it's real bad right now. I'll let Brian talk about it a little bit more on, on the riprap stabilization. We also have um, cross sections, you know, I think that show how much riprap and stabilizer we're going to put there to protect against any future erosion. But how does that affect 300 yards upstream? It's the the box is 12 feet wide, right? 12 feet wide. Today you've got a five foot circular pipe. So that's that slowing the water down because it can't get through it until it breaches the road. 
And so now that you have a bigger area coming through, the water moving faster, is the washout going to be worse? Water's not going to move faster because you got more area. So if, it, if you got that five foot pipe, and that's what's happening right now, especially where it is today, it's hanging. So when that pipe fills up and starts backing up, because I know what the last meeting was, <coughs> that's all you talked about was water backing up all the way. Mm -hmm. It's not going to do that now. Well, that's not all I talked about. <laughs> <laughs> You're absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you that. Yeah, there's more. Yeah. So, okay. And, and let's get back then to work, too, because, I mean, my business is going to be affected the most. Um, if you are disrupting that flow during the day, I mean, during the peak business time for me, both time and time of year. Yeah, that's why, you know, we're, we're, we're still, we still have to work, look at are we going to do nighttime construction, which seems feasible. Um, as far as physical residential homes close to this area, you know, we, we've got some up here over here, but I think it's far enough away so it's not really going to affect the residents, but it also expedites the construction a little faster if we do nighttime. Yeah, but that's it will affect stuff. my business that that's nighttime? right there. No, if you do it during the day, that's why. Right, that's why I'm looking at nighttime so we make as less Just to make that as possible. <laughs> so, you know, from that standpoint, that's all stuff that we're, we haven't finalized yet, but <coughs> it's obviously going to be discussion with Todd so he can take it to council. I don't know if you have a nighttime work ordinance in, in town. We do. I'll have to check it and see if there's any provisions in there for highway maintenance and construction. I mean, everyone in the room, is there, is there any objections about going nighttime construction if that's the way we choose to go? I mean, it's going to be by far the fastest approach to get the project done. Um, and less inconvenience, number one, on your commuters in the daytime, businesses in the daytime, to do it at nighttime, um, just because we do have a high volume of traffic. Um, so we'll we'll take that we'll take this back and, and analyze a little more. And once we do finalize, you know, if we're going to go nighttime, obviously I'll coordinate with Todd, and you can coordinate with his folks to develop that, and finalize it, and get that information out. You know, when we when we do finalize this, where everybody's aware. Of especially on the emergency side of things, you know, what we're going to be doing there. Sir? Reynolds Tyler from the Rundle Fire Department. When you put the bonds culvert in, is that going to be put in in two halves, or is it going to be one piece? It's going to be actually probably four foot long. Okay. So there's always going to be one lane open for emergency access? Yeah, I mean, we, we can put plates up if we have to, but, you know, it, they're probably going to try to get, expedite that as much as possible, you know, so we, yes, we have to make provisions for... Because that, that's the major route to Southern Maine Medical Center, and all the ambulances from that side of the county come down that way, so we, we've got to have at least one lane open at all times. Yes, absolutely. Right. So, I'm Roger Rupert from Lyman. For traffic going east or towards Biddeford, is there going to be a, a lane or provision for them to turn left onto the hill road? Come here. Yeah, if they're, well, if they're coming down 111 from Santa. Yep. Yeah, so they're going to be permission yeah. to turn left on the hill road. Yep. And that's with a light. With a turn lane. With a light. Is it going to be turn lane and light? Okay. Yep. It's going to be. It's a, it's, a through, it's a through and a left. Okay. But there's going to be a wide enough shoulder so people can go around if it's during a green. Okay. If this is green, there'll be room enough for cars to go around that left hand turn. And on this light, are there going to be any traffic preemptors for emergency vehicles? We haven't got that far yet, but I think we need to put preempt in yes. there, obviously, for your purpose. Yes. Thanks. Sir? Yeah, Bruce Mullen, uh, Chief of Rundle Fire and Rescue. If you should end up during the daytime, uh, are you going to try to maintain two lanes of traffic both ways when you're doing construction, or are you going to cut it back to one? I think we got room enough to do two lanes. Okay, because I'm going to say, you know as bad how bad the traffic is. You cut down to one lane, it's going to be backed up forever. And that will interfere with our response. All right, thank you very much. So, Kenneth uh, Burr from Lyman. My question is, if you put a signal in here, has there been a traffic count to know what the traffic is here, which you're going to take off 35 with the light? But there's no way to there's no way to project that until it's done, unfortunately. Because with the traffic light being in there, this means it's going to be a lot more traffic on the lineman side of the hill road on the hill road itself. Possibly, and that's one of the things that we kind of <coughs> talked about and analyzed at the department was the mobility thing. You know, 
because it is going to affect mobility because people know that stretch, know that core. So if they know there's a signal here and they can get out nice and easy, then that's going to increase the flow. Well, there's going to put more traffic for a residential area, whereas 35 is a, a feeder line. So. Yeah. But more traffic came when the lights got put on 35 that came down here because people didn't want to wait at the lights at 35. And so the traffic really increased at that point. Yeah. And so, I think the, the, the biggest thing on that is that, you know, we ought to look at truck traffic. Right now it's posted seven ton headed toward Lyman, five ton coming from Lyman. So probably we need to try to get that seven ton down to five ton um, to match, um, to keep trucks off there. Obviously they, they probably still do. They always will. So that's just, that's just nature and people say that's a shortcut for me. So they're going to keep doing it, but from the standpoint of the design, it doesn't accommodate those bigger truck turning movements. The other thing is anybody that uses a GPS can take them out that way. If they go in that direction anyway, of course, GPS it doesn't know the difference between truck route, commercial, and regular route. Right. So that's all stuff that when we do this type of project, those are all the concerns. And, you know, there's, there's no way to really... You can enforce it, but that's about all, all the uh, things we can hope for is that there is enforcement out there that covers that. Yeah. Do you have an estimate of how long? Mean? Sorry, Daddy Robbins. Um, do you have an estimate of how long you think it would take from beginning to end to do this project? The highway is the real easy part. Um, Brian, you got an idea on the time frame for that box? Uh, we did we did a lot of uh, box replacements with total road closures in two or three two or three weeks. They can get the old one out and do one in. But in staging it maybe a little longer because it's just it's more difficult. Okay. Juggle the sequence in yeah, probably three, four weeks, I guess the contract for you that. Maybe yeah. most of the four weeks. So I'm guessing probably overall two months for the project completion. And you said something about the signals. I don't know how you I don't know how you're going to set the signals up. I mean, are you going to set them up so if there's no one on Hill Road, it will stop the traffic on 111? Is that what the expectation would be? Yeah, they're, they're going to have they're going to have loops so they'll detect it. Then from when they detect that vehicle, there's a, a delay in the timing, um, and that will trigger the, the light to turn once it detects to a certain point of number of cars, and it hits that that loop detector, and then it triggers the signal to switch. Okay. Because what I what I would hate to see is I would hate to see 111 backed up all the way to my house because it does because it does it down at different crossings and it does it at various other places. As soon as somebody gets there, it it, 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 it triggers the lights and everybody stops. If it does, don't call me. <laughs> oh, <I don't> <laughs> she will. But no, but the, the, the delay is going to be very short here. Okay. Um, it's it's going to be. It's not going to allow for much time to back up because you're only talking these movements here coming out. So you're, you're going to probably maybe give these folks 10, 10 seconds to flush out, then it's going to change again. Okay. Well, the, the only reason I say it is because I, while I own this property, I live up in between here and 35. And I can tell when 35 light hits because if I'm at the end of the road, I can count 50, 60 hours <laughs> before I can get out. So, and the other, the other thing, and I brought this up at the last meeting, and I'm still trying to figure out how my fields are all hay, and I'm still trying to figure out how he's going to get his tractor from Hill Road across these lanes into that little <coughs> section on the other on the other side. I don't know if there's anything we can do to improve that so he's not hanging out there, but I mean I don't think you can improve your plan. I'm, I'm just trying to figure out how he's going to get over. I mean, he's been hit once already. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, and, and he's a, so he's coming down Hill Road. He's coming down Hill Road, and then he goes right. Nope. No, there is one that comes off. The right there. Yes. Yeah. He goes. He go. He goes down this way to go to the other fields, but he'll go down this way and in right here. This is my right away. And then he comes out this way and back. But he's also got his hay wagon behind him. So 
I'm just trying to figure how he's going to be able to. And maybe this will make it easier for him. It should. Because he'll have the he'll have the signal and the timing of that signal coming out. He'll go to either come over here and get on this shoulder, okay. or come over here and cut across. I think it'll be easier for him to turn now. Yeah. But it's getting it's getting across, especially if the light just yeah. We'll see what happens. Any other questions, sir? Phil Laddie, why can the state not reduce the speed limit? There's hundreds and hundreds of trucks, anywhere from 30 to 100,000 pounds going up and down that road. When that light decides to trip, two or three cars slam the brakes on, somebody's coming down through with 70, 80,000 pounds or more. It could be a not too pretty scene right there at 50 miles an hour. Right. A, truck, a, a loaded truck at 60, 80, 100,000 pounds at 50 miles an hour is not going to stop as fast as a car that decides for a trip line. It could get pretty bad. And it should be at least 40. <coughs> yeah, and, I, and I know, I haven't seen the results, but I put in a request probably two months ago to do a speed study just to, to verify things. Um, I haven't got that yet, so I hope I get that as soon as, soon as I get it, I can share it with Todd. But my gut tells me it's probably not going to change. I don't know how many people have to get hurt or killed or bring people to changes. And, and again, you know, it's the other, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. You know, if, if you don't put a signal there, then it goes away, right? Not right. completely. Completely. You won't have any rear end crashes if it goes away. Well, yes, will. Yeah, you will. Yes, you will. People turn around. From Sanford to Hill Road, yeah, all all time. right? But I'm just talking this intersection. If the signal yeah. goes away, then a lot of that conflict goes away. Not for the people turning off on the Hill Road from Sanford, right? I'm not talking about the left-hand turn. I'm talking about the through lane. I'm talking about the trucks doing 60 miles an hour. They're still going to be able to do 60. Then you're just talking about driver behavior coming out of Hill Road like we have today, which isn't very good behavior. You know, so there's there's a lot of things that. You have to weigh it, you know. So is the signal going to make it safer? Overall, overall intersection safety, is the signal going to make it safer? Absolutely. So then you still have your concern, which you will exist. I agree with your life, 100%. Yeah. What I disagree with is the speed zone through there. Yeah, I agree. But it's high. Tons but of trucks. If they go speed limit, we're fine. But they're not doing the speed limit. They they're going to 10, if 15, 20, or 60. Yeah. So that's the problem. It's so not 40. Yeah. Give them out. They're still going to do 60. They're still going to do 60. So I mean, that's that's something that we fight statewide, and you know, it, it just comes down to enforcement issue. It's just the same thing we fight as a design agency is resources. You know, we only have so many resources to design projects. You know, and execute. It. You know, same thing on the on the police police side, sheriff side. Same thing. They're fighting resources and availability. Sir, um, Roger Wooper, I'm the fire chief for Lyman. October, I think it was October, November, just before you cut the, the groove down the center through 111, we had, there was a DOT meeting up at the State Police Barracks in Alfred, and we talked about the speed study. Yep. And it was mentioned then that there had been a speed study called for to study the whole one on the corridor. And that was almost six months ago. So what's what's the time frame from when a speed study is initiated to when we see the results of the study? Uh, the other problem that we're fighting is, is that our traffic engineer that probably started the speed study is now back out in Missouri. He's where? Went back to Missouri. Oh, we'll be back here. <laughs> exactly. Right. Summertime. Yeah. So, okay. so we got we got a, that's that's a transition that we're we're battling right now is that we brought someone someone on board now that has no traffic engineer experience, so we're getting they got to get him up to speed. So I, I wrote that down on the speed study, but I think. There was another speed study on 111 that was done. Kate's butter. They did. No, oh, well, they did one in at the request of the board of selectmen. Right. Uh, end of 2012, I believe. It sounds and, about right. Yeah, that was request ago. was denied as well. Because yeah. one of the things the troopers mentioned at that, that particular <clears throat> meeting was the problem with Route 111 is that there are too many different speed zones. 
and, and it's difficult for them to enforce those multiple speed zones up and down the road. One of the talk was to make the speed zone more uniform, but, but something doesn't even have about the speed, and we need to also help make it easier for the state and the sheriff to enforce those speed limits. So I'd be anxious to see that speed study. Yeah, I'll, I'm going to, because I really think that's the only issue that we have based off this design, to be honest with you, is, is I knew the speed was going to come up. There's, there's not a lot we can do because of the corridor. Try to keep the consistency, like you mentioned, and that's what they look at is corridor consistency with speeds instead of drop them, raise them, drop them, because it does make it difficult. But I will uh, follow back up with uh, with Todd, and he can share that. So, yeah, uh, Bruce Mullen, Chief of Rundle Fire. Uh, a couple of things is in a case like that where the speed limit could stay the same. Uh, you can lengthen the length of the yellow light so that it would be more apt to not jam them up and have them pile into it. The other thing is, do the selectmen have the right to petition the state to change the speed limit in any area? You can petition it, but I think, I think they have petitioned. We tried once passed. already. You yeah. did. Yeah. yeah, we petitioned when the no, I meant once the light's in. I mean, it seems to me when you when they put it's the light in at Jackson's corner, 5 and 35, uh, excuse me, 35 and 111, that they did slow the speed limits down to 35 because of that reason, because everybody's doing 75 miles an hour. Right. Uh, and I, I think Mr. Blatney makes a good point that, and you know as well as I do, they're doing 70 miles an hour. If we can at least lower them to 40, maybe they don't want to be doing 50 miles an hour. Right. 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 We'll look at that and uh, try to see if there's a way we can monitor it. And you're absolutely right on the, on the delay. You know, even though we have, it's like say it's a 15 second, 15 second green time coming out of Hill Road. Then you have, say, another seven or eight second delay in that yellow before that goes to red and this goes to green. So that gives you more more time. So that's something we can definitely look at. Thank you. Thank you, Robin Zavondo. You said something about um, lowering the weight limit on Hill Road from seven to five. Um, would that affect the dairy truck that has to go up to the dairy to pick up the milk? I don't believe so. I don't think it's oh, there. There are you. That's a local delivery. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I just want to. I just want to. Agri coming through. It's it's okay. Okay. It's not a constant thing. It's just. Okay. You know, You're talking about eighteen wheelers. Okay. Eighteen wheelers. Okay. 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 Ok
stripes to obviously, hopefully people obey that and not pass at the signal. Well, they, station, but. they won't listen to us. They pass. I mean, you know, lucky you didn't have a few less rumble and lime on the residence last week. Yeah, I, just one more uh, question, comment, whatever. When this gets ready to go, is it something that uh, the DOT or whoever, is it possible that notices go out or they put something on 111 so these truckers will know that over the next two months there's going to be construction? They might find alternate routes or just, I mean, I know you could put it in the paper and stuff, but I, I don't want to put billboards all over the place. Yeah, they're going to send a tweet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Is there any way that that can be sent out to? I mean, you can't send it to every company in the in the in the world, but no. But what we can do is put maybe some variable message boards out in strategic locations to you know just warn folks. You know, construction ahead, seek alternative routes. Um, so that's some construction that in two weeks or something. Right? You see it sometimes on the oh. turnpike and stuff. Cool. I realize they got all sorts of money on the turnpike. Yep. Yeah, so. yeah, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Okay, well thank you all for coming and we'll hang out to take individual comments.